Demon Souls is a 2009 PS3 exclusive created by From Software and directed by one Hidetaka Miyazaki. But at this point, that's something everybody knows. Not funny. But that's mainly from the success of their later titles, namely the Dark Souls series. Due to the immense popularity, this left Demon Souls somewhat forgotten, and with the PS5 remake on the way, I figured now would be a great time to look at the original release, see what it got so right on a first attempt, and what it got not so right. To clarify, this footage isn't my own, uh, this has been provided by some very kind new channels, of who I will link in the description below, but I will be talking about my own thoughts and experiences about the game as I have played this all the way through. The game does a pretty good job of getting you into the world of Boletaria through both a gameplay and a story perspective. It starts off with a character customization screen that lets you choose the character class and appearance before a traditional cutscene, and you're dropped off in the tutorial area. In my character customization, I'm really not picky with these sorts of things. I use, I just went in with a generic soldier on night class, sword and shield. I don't mess with magic in these games. I play straight sword and, sword and shield. Uh, but the traditional cutscene explains why the world is absolutely fucking overrun with demons, and that the player character is a traveler taking on the challenge of the Scourge. And once you're dropped in the tutorial area, it gives you the basics of the gameplay um, through experimenting and via messages left on the ground that give you the basics. Like its later contemporaries, the, the reasons these work so well is because the tutorial is controlled by the pace of the player. If you're a returning player or know how these games work, you can completely skip over the messages and get straight into the action, whereas a new player can stop and take their time getting used to the game, which I think, especially with Demon Souls, is very valuable. Getting past the tutorial brings the player face to face with the first real boss quote unquote of the game, the Vanguard. Now this is a fight you're really supposed to lose, but the cool thing about the Vanguard is that you can beat it if your sick gamer skills are in check. Me, playing the other Souls games before this and being overconfident, thought that the Vanguard wasn't going to be an issue, or need to get my shit absolutely pushed in a couple minutes into the fight. Uh, but I think it's super cool that the game actively rewards you like this if you're good enough, and it does a good job of enforcing both the slim glimmer of hope the Slayer of Demons represents, as well as the oppressive atmosphere of the Demon Souls world entirely just through its gameplay. Uh, yet you do get rewarded for beating the Vanguard, but quickly get put in your place after by the Dragon God. No matter what you do, you are going to die in this game, <laughs> which nicely brings us to the main hub of the game, the Nexus. After dying to the Vanguard, or getting beaten to death by the Dragon God if you're good enough, you're transported to the Nexus, which is the hub area of the game. At this point there isn't really much to see apart from the bare essentials, you get a little intro to important NPCs such as the Maiden in Black, the Crestfallen Warrior, Stockpile Thomas, among a few others. However, this is where my first real gripe with Demon Souls comes into play, although I can admit it's minor. The Maiden in Black, she shows up in a cutscene and then just she just fucks off. Now this is because you can't level up without beating the first boss of the game, the Phalanx, um, but the game does a really bad job of telling you this in my opinion, so you could in theory spend minutes looking around the Nexus for her and she's just... No, she's just not there. So since we can't level up yet, let's get into the first section of the game, Boletaria 1 slash 1. Now the game isn't done teaching you about itself. This section is a really great introduction to things such as ambushes, environmental hazards, and to a lesser extent the world tendency mechanic, which I'll get into a bit more later. Uh, at this point, Demon Souls also introduces more complex enemy types, such as the red-eyed and blue-eyed knights, which again can be mentioned or be taken on at the player's pace, which I mentioned in the tutorial section of the video. 
as well as getting them started with the how side quest works in the game, starting with one of the more compelling ones, I feel. This is around Stockpile Thomas and the abandonment of his family. This creates a really nice attachment to such an essential NPC, which I think was really important for the game to do, as well as giving the player one of the most important items in the game. Now, the name of the ring specifically escapes me, but it's a ring that gives you more of your, more or most of your health back when you're in soul form. Exploring the area and opening up the main castle opens up the path to the Phalanx. Um, now, this boss isn't really very interesting from a gameplay, pers gameplay perspective. The boss is pretty easy and the game absolutely showers you with fire-based items, which is this boss's weakness. But I think it is interesting that once the little mooks are beaten that crowd around it, the boss now actively runs away from the player. Um, now, this is supposed to reflect the boss's previous life in lore, as far as I'm aware a sniper who stays in the back of the battlefield and this example of internal consistency in storytelling is what i think deep one of demon souls best traits and this is even compared to later souls games After killing the Phalanx, you can finally start to access the full usefulness of the Maiden in Black. You'll be seeing her pretty often as she's the way you level up your character and whatever stat points that you'd like. Personally, I always play the Souls games as a knight. I've never messed with magic and I find the melee combat to be the more enjoyable way of playing. But investing in magic can be a really great way to get an upper hand in the game, especially in Demon Souls. Magic is probably the most OP in this game out of all of the Soul series, so arguably the easiest way to get overpowered is just by using magic. Whenever I play personally, it's always the big swords, big axes, big bonk weapons all the way for me. Uh, but moving on to the second part of Boletaria Castle is what my opinion is to be the absolute worst part of Demon's Souls, and that's the performance in some parts. Apart from meeting another, another semi-important NPC, Ostrava, the main part of this level is the Dragon Obstacle Course. Um, now the concept of this is pretty simple. You wait for the dragon to use its fire breath, you run to the next part of the tower, rinse and repeat till you're at the end. However, whenever the dragon does as much as move a muscle, the game chugs, and it chugs really, really hard. Now, I generally think Demon Souls is a game that holds up fantastically well, um, but it really struggles in more than a few areas performance-wise. This is something that the remake absolutely needs, and I think it is going to address an update, but what I would also like is the dragons to be a bit more dynamic, for lack of a better term. Generally, I think that this game does a really good job of making enemies, both minor and bosses, feel alive. Um, but the dragons have a set path that they'll always follow no matter what. Like, you can go to the top of this tower, pelt this dragon with arrows, and it will not do as much as try and stop you. Um, because it's away from its set path. Uh, so it'll always do go through that section no matter what. This is probably due to technical limitations, but it always takes me a little bit out of this game whenever I get to this section. Moving on to the boss of this area, we're faced with the imposing Tower Knight. This boss and cutscene introducing it does a lot of cool things. We're given the first sight of the Fat Ministers, a figure that personally I find just as imposing as the Tower Knight, whereas the Tower Knight itself creates tension from its size difference alone, and the Fat Ministers have by far the most grotesque design in Demon Souls, and the fact that they seem to control or at least be a big factor as to why Boletaria is so corrupted plays into their imposing nature. In the actual fight, however, you quickly find that the archers are the most imposing things in this fight, as if you don't get right up to them and get rid of them quickly, you're likely going to die, and you're going to die pretty fast. Which leaves you alone with a tower knight. At first, damage him seems impossible until you see the steam coming out of his legs. You need to hit him more, and he eventually goes down, allowing the player to organically discover its weakness, the head, and plan accordingly. This fight is generally pretty easy, but it does a really great job of teaching the player how to fight it through the gameplay alone. There'll be more examples of this throughout the game, but for now, we're going to leave our journey through Boletaria Castle and look through some other areas in the game. For whatever reason, although it's definitely not the worst designed area of the game, trust me, 
We're gonna get to that later. I find Stonefang Tunnel to be the least interesting to talk about, so let's use this as an excuse to talk about how the gameplay is structured and the world tendency mechanic that I touched on earlier, so let's start with that. Although its effects are much more muted due to the servers closing down, the basics are this. World tendency can go either white or black depending on what you do in the game. For example, if you kill a boss, it goes towards white. Whereas if you kill a helpful NPC, like Stockpile Thomas for example, it will shift towards black. Depending on where your tendency falls, different things can happen in the world. Certain paths and items will become available, enemies will become easier or harder to defeat depending on if you fall closer to white or black. Now in concept, I think this is a really interesting gameplay mechanic, however the actual execution falls short in few ways. Firstly, for how important this mechanic is to the game, the game barely explains anything to you at all, leaving it to be quite obtuse and the best way to learn about it is looking elsewhere online. Now I played Demon Souls for the first time earlier this year, so I had to really had no way to experience this mechanic to its fullest. Although it's closely linked to online player and killing invading players, for the remake I really hope that the keep this mechanic but also explain the mechanics in a more grounded way or they could make it a bit easier to influence it one way or the other as it's a great way to boost the game's replayability and that could be explored a lot more in the remake I feel. Another unique thing about this game is how open-ended it is, although open-ended in a different way to Dark Souls, the game coming after Demon Souls. After the first couple of sections in Boletari, you can go to whatever part of the world that you'd like, and the game will give you deep different items accordingly. The castle gives you healing grass, Stonefang is the best place for upgrading weapons, the Tower of Latry gives you status healing items and so on, which I feel is the best way to play the game is going between different world sections as opposed to doing a whole arch stone in one go. The boss of this section is the Armoured Spider, and like the area, I don't think this boss is especially interesting to talk about. You just need to get in close, keep the aggression up, and make sure you have enough grass pack to brute force its body charms, and really you should be fine. In the second section of Stonefang Tunnel is more of the same, but one thing I wanted to praise this area for is the internal logic and consistency in how the world works. Through this section, our old questionable looking friends the Fat Ministers make another appearance, and it seems like they're controlling the slowly dying miners who collect the ores to upgrade weapons. Purely due to enemy placement, it's pretty easy to assume that this is how the army of Boletaria gathers materials for their weaponry. This is another telling example of story elements that are told purely through environmental design and enemy placement. There are plenty of examples of this in Demon Souls, but I believe this is one of the strongest examples of this. Now the next main boss of this area is the Flame Lurker, one of the most aggressive enemies in the game and one of the most interesting bosses from a design perspective in my opinion. It could be theorised, and this is something I personally think to be true, is that the Flame Lurker was the legendary Big M in a past life, and Big M was what, some sort of blacksmith. From the hands of God you find in his boss room and dialogue from the blacksmiths earlier in the level, and from the design of the Flame Lurker's head, the things around his eyes almost look like to be protective goggles that a blacksmith would use while working. Moreover, if you aggro a blacksmith, they will attack you purely through fists. Uh, now this could purely be coincidental, but I think it could also be a subtle little nod to him being the big M and either knowing or being an inspiration for blacksmiths in a past life. With that said, um, we're done with Stonefine Tunnel for now and we're going to be exploring a couple different areas in the next sections of the video. If we're going by Archstone order, the next area that we would discuss would be the Tower of Latria, however I wanted to go over to the Shrine of Storms first instead, as I feel it creates an interesting dynamic at this early point in the game, specifically with a melee build. The enemies in this area are a pretty big step up in challenge, however if you're good enough at backstabbing them, you can get past the anime katana skeleton and you can get the crescent falchion, which is a fantastic weapon throughout the vast majority of the game, and I used it for the game as well. 
This area also sees the return of the Vanguard, which on one hand is a really cool way of seeing how you've improved as a player from the tutorial, but I also feel sorry for the poor fucker that chose this as the first section to go through and you're just greeted by this bastard again, it's like he's mocking you. Although unintentional, there are two main ways you can get through to the boss of this section. The Adjudicator. Uh, you can do what the game intends and go through a trap-filled underground section, or you can brace your inner skeleton and keep rolling, rolling, rolling. <laughs> Lin off the part of the top of the castle and skip a large section of the level. Although it's clearly a bug, it's these kinds of things that I sincerely hope are kept for the remake. Glitches like these that benefit the player from a PvE perspective are ultimately harmless and, in my opinion, add more character to the game. The Adjudicator isn't really much to write home about, being one of if not the easiest boss in the Soul series, let alone this game, but I like how the judge actually seems to be the little bird and the body below protects it and it's just another demon. We'll get into this we'll get into this deeper into the level, but the Shrine of Storms does the best job of putting forward the true reason why I think the bosses are around, that it's the old one bringing ancient legends of different lands to life, but like I say we'll get into that a little bit later. But with the Adjudicator taken care of, we're going to leave that topic later and pay a little visit to the Tower of Latria. I'm just going to be completely honest and level with you here, I just fucking love the Tower of Latria so much. This and the later sections of Boletaria Castle are my favourite sections in this game. This section is just dripping with this intense, oppressive atmosphere, with the chiming of the mind flayers, the blood splattered floors, the screaming of the prisoners in the background, it just all blends together so well to create this intense, harrowing experience all the way through exploring, even if isn't, this isn't your first time going through the level. Now the boss of this area is the Fool's Idol, and like with most bosses in this game, it finds a way to bring an interesting, memorable gimmick. Not only is this a boss that duplicates itself, pretty standard fare so far, but if you haven't paid a visit to the simp at the top balcony, the demon slain text won't appear when you kill the fool's idol, and if you leave, the boss will respawn in that area until you put the tier 3 fool's idol patreon donator out of his misery. Now I can only imagine how players must have felt when this game first came out, having no clue why this boss just kept reappearing, but that's one of the biggest appeals to Demon Souls in my opinion. How just unapologetic it is about being cryptic and just being itself, but you kill the fool's idol and her little gargoyle friends bring you up to the next section of the tower. The next area of the Tower of Latria is more of the same brilliant level design as the first section, although something I noticed, particularly in 3-2, is how reminiscent this area is to a good few sections of FromSoft's later title, Bloodborne. I guess it's all the big eyes slash brain imagery, but who knows. Uh, in this area you'll meet up with probably the most evil NPC in the game. If you take him back to the Nexus and leave him alone, he'll kill your NPCs and open up a new side quest with Mes Mephistopheles. But I didn't want to kill any of my homies, so I just kicked him off the edge of the cliff as soon as I saw him. Uh, the boss of this area has become rather infamous to say the least in the community, this being the man eaters. The bane of many players' existence. They fly around, there's two of them, they can knock you off the platform with relative ease, but... I mean, from what I've heard, I guess I just got lucky when I fought them. I've seen and heard so many horror stories of this boss, but... I managed to meet a pure melee build, no bullshit with the arrows at the fog door, my first time. My advice would be staying towards the back centre of the stage when fighting the first one, uh, and using the big candle in the middle as somewhat of a shield to give you an edge on the fight for the second man eater, and you should be golden.
The next area of the Shrine of Storms is, in my opinion, one of the more annoying sections in the game. I like the concept of a mini-boss that summons undead enemies endlessly until you kill them, but especially later on they'll show up in the most goddamn frustrating of places and just laser you to death, to the point where in a couple of places the best thing to do is just dodge roll through them. So instead I'm going to use this section to continue my earlier point last time we were at the Shrine of Storms. From context clues in other areas, but especially here, it seems like the reason the Slayer of Demons fights all of these fantastical creatures is that the Old One actually brings bosses to life from legends in their culture. This can be seen from areas like Boletaria Castle with the Tower Knight and the Phalanx based on legendary figures from their army, to the Adjudicator and the Old Hero seeming to be brought about from stories from this particular land. Some bosses in later Souls entries don't really have much in-depth reason to be around, with the exception of those close to Gwyn, so I find this little detail to be extremely interesting, and I really hope this is expanded upon more with the remake with more in-depth item descriptions and such. Speaking of the old hero, he's the next boss that will fight, and again carrying on with unique ideas and boss battles, the old hero is very, very aggressive, one of the harder bosses in the game, as he's wearing a blindfold, his hearing is enhanced so he can track you down if you so much as sprint for too long. However, if you have the Feats Ring equipped, which reduces the sound your character makes, which means enemies have a harder time tracking you, as I believe it re reduces their aggro range, the same thing goes for the old hero. And as long as you don't get too greedy, he has a really tough time finding out where you are, and just kind of goes berserk to the environment in an attempt to track you down. With the old hero taken down, we're going to take a little trip to the Valley of Defilement before we get to the Archdemons. The Valley of Defilement. <sighs> the start of the infamous FromSoft Poison Swamp trend. The bane of pretty much every Souls fan's existence, it seems. While I don't particularly hate this level, I can't really say I'm a huge fan, but the first section of it isn't so bad in my opinion. We're introduced to the first recurring character of this level, um, the old woman? I don't know if she has any other name. Who will sell us an invaluable item for this level, a cure for the plague ailment. I generally don't have much to complain about in this stage, the design of the way of traversing the world is interesting, however there is one thing in this level that I cannot forgive, the rats. God damn, I despise these little fuckers with a passion, it's far more of an effort than it should be to aim the, these little monsters even with the lock on due to their jittery movement, along with them being able to inflict plague, which is an nearly instant kill element very easily. I know they're annoying as fuck, you know they're annoying as fuck, so let's just move on to the boss of this level. And speaking of annoying as fuck, the Leechmonger is one of the few bosses in this game that I really, really dislike. If you play a ranged build, this boss is an absolute joke. If you play a melee build, you have to deal with its weird, almost unrecognisable movement patterns. It's not exactly a hard boss, especially if you have anything fire related with you, it's just one of those bosses that are really poorly designed I think. The only cool thing about this boss is to do with the ragdoll corpses in the upper floor. If you push them down, the game actually remembers that you pushed them down there and you can get different items depending on how many corpses you've pushed into the abyss. I have absolutely no clue how or why the game remembers this, but hey, it's a cool bit of trivia I guess. The next area is where my issues with this level really rear their ugly head however. It's mostly nothing but vast, almost empty swamp water that you can only slow walk or fat roll through. Fun! <laughs> Very fun! Uh, there's really not much to say to this stage. 90% of the, the aforementioned swamp water with a few bits of land to break up the tedium of travelling through. There's not really much to say about this stage apart from the fact that you can get the Moonlight Greatsword, a nice reference to FromSoft previous titles, the Kingsfield series. Since I really don't have any much to say about this stage or experience with Kingsfield, I want to talk a little about how Demon Souls subverse expectations with its lore. When you speak to the old woman a bit more, she makes reference to the reason as to why the Valley of Defilement is so corrupted, and that's due to the Archdemon of this level, Maiden Astraya. Now this comes across as nothing more than jealousy or, or lack of attention being directed at her rather than the old woman. 
but from the item descriptions and dialogue in the Japanese version of the game, it seems like the Maiden's attempts to fix the valley have caused the men of the valley to become fixated on her, and instead kill anyone who's coming to the valley in an attempt to help them in order to offer gifts to the Maiden. Like many things in Demon Souls, it leaves the player to ask themselves later on uh, interesting questions, such as, is the old woman telling the truth, or is she spouting lies out of jealousy and ire? Who knows, it's never directly said, and that's what I love about this game. Anyway, the boss of this section is the Dirty Colossus, and again, I don't really have much to say about this boss fight. It's not really annoying like the Leechmonger, more so just a typical brawler kind of fight. Again, fire is your best friend here. The fly mechanic is again a unique concept, but keeping fire with you or going to one of the nearby torches makes them basically a non-issue. Since there isn't much of these areas other than the bosses in question, I figured the best thing to do will be going through the Archdemon's Rapid Fire before tackling the rest of Boletaria in the end game. So let's start with Stonefang Tunnel and the CEO of beating you to death himself, the Dragon God, one of my least favourite bosses in this game personally. It's a matter of pulling two harpoons and bashing his chin until it dies. Really anticlimactic for what I thought was really good build up and a really intimidating design. This script and video was made before the remake of Demon's Souls released, and honestly I'm not sure how they could improve this fight, perhaps maybe making the Dragon God able to move around and interact with the player a bit more rather than just bonking him, but I do hope that this is the one fight that they adjust for the remake. Other than The only other thing of note in this area is that depending on the player's world tendency, you can get a very interesting weapon for this area, the Dragon Bone Smasher, a hunk of metal that could barely be called a sword. <laughs> not so subtle reference to the manga series Berserk, a big inspiration for Miyazaki for this game and FromSoft's next game, Dark Souls. Unfortunately, I couldn't manage to get it in my game file as shifting world tendency is actually quite the challenge due to the servers being down in my experience, other than killing NPCs, which I really didn't want to do. But, but due to the, we're going to move on to the next Archdemon, the Old Monk, so I'm going to use this fight to talk a little bit more about how the Demon Souls experience has shifted slightly with the servers being down now. Whilst the old monk boss fight is against an admittedly unique NPC, the game actually attempted to pit you against another player when the servers were still active. This particular type of boss will be seen again in the Soul sequels, but it works especially well here, as it's heavily implied the source of a lot of the evil is the corrupt headwear the monk and NPC are wrapped in. So it could be assumed that they're summoning yet another possessed servant to do their bidding and further corrupting Latria with this cursed headscarf from a foreign land or legend. Well, that's how I always viewed this fight anyway, and with that Archdemon out of the way, we're going to move on to the Storm King fight, yet another example of what I think the old one is doing to these areas, whether knowingly or not. The Storm King is what I think is a really good example of a spectacle fight. Upon looking at, around the battlefield, you can pick up this weapon, the Storm Ruler, and it has a special ability that only works in this specific area. You swing your sword around and go ham on those flying manta rays before taking on the Storm King. It's said in the item description this is the only blade that can harm this creature, again playing into what I mentioned earlier about the old one bringing old legends to life, which plays really well into the most harrowing aspect of Demon Souls from a story perspective. Nearly everything you come across from comes from lore or tradition that people created. It feels like almost everything, despite the supernatural circumstances, still comes across from a place of human-made horror, which I personally find far more creepier than the, than the more mystical horror seen in the Dark Souls games but that's just me. With the Storm King beaten, we get to go to not only my favourite Archdemon, but my favourite boss fight from FromSoft's library, Maiden Astraya. The setup of this is nothing short of perfect. You walk into the boss room and the mooks you've been fighting for the past few sections completely ignore you, and the Maiden politely asks you to leave. From there, you have a few options in terms of how to proceed. If you use a bow, you can snipe the Maiden from afar, you know, like a coward, or you could try going through the poison swamp and try dealing with the plague dealing skin babies, or what I personally recommend, 
going one on one with her bodyguard, Gal Vinland. Now the reason why I would advise fighting Gal regardless of the challenge, especially if you're not good at parrying, is how much it adds to the fight. His and her back and forth with their dialogue, the music, it really makes the player question if everything they've done so far is worth it. If what we've been doing for the whole game is going to change anything, or is the player worse than the demons that they're about to slay? This is one fight that I sincerely hope that they don't touch for the remake. The understated nature of the fight is absolutely perfect, and if there's one thing that I sincerely hope they don't touch or adjust at all, it would have to be this boss fight. And with that gushing out of the way, we're going to move on to the last section of Boletaria and the end of the game. And so we've come full circle, right back to where we started at the beginning of this analysis, and we're greeted by an unfortunately familiar figure. The Fat Minister seems to be welcoming us in before running out of view, and unlike most if not all areas in the game, here the game certainly gives an idea of where to go and what exactly our target is, which is a nice change of pace. This fat fuck that's made our life so difficult at the start of the game. Environmentally wise, this specific section of Boletaria is probably my favourite area in the entire game. Past the castle and battlefield areas, this seems to be like a town or a town square. Something about this area to me just feels very lived in, and the contrast of these high rising buildings and the absolute state of death and decay around every corner feels really eerie to me. Taking a little detour into the alleyway so you can find a small side quest involving Yuria the witch tucked away. Tricking one of the fat ministers into thinking you're one of them by equipping their cap found earlier in the level, you can make him lower the bridge for you to climb up. Now something about this whole setup and area feels really disturbing in particular to me. How tucked away this specific area is, that the minister only lets you up if he thinks that you're one of them, and the implication of what exactly he's going to do to Yuria. Thanks to her dialogue and the fact the only thing up here is a filthy looking rag or a makeshift bed sheet, it's not hard to guess what was happening to this poor woman. This plays into why the Fat Ministers are probably my favourite, for lack of a better term, generic enemy type. They seem to represent all the depravity, ruin and misery across all of the game, but especially in Boletaria. In fact, I'd really love to see their role in the game expanded upon in the remake somehow, whether that's giving one a speaking role or even beefing up one in a boss fight. In this area, the minister will attempt to stop you at every turn, making the player use shortcuts and gaps in the environment to work around and get to their goal, even coming back to help Hostrava on the way up to the castle. Now, the boss of this area is a nice, uh, is a nice piece of deception, I feel. I was under the impression when I first played the game that this minister we were chasing was going to be the boss of this area and that we were going to fight him, and just as it seems we're going to get that chance, BAM! The fucking penetrator comes in and kills him. This makes for a really excellent and intimidating first impression. And it's just a shame that this is one of the easiest bosses in the game. Even if you haven't rescued Bjork to assist you at this point, this is one of the bosses I think really should be touched up for in the remake as well, as I feel the faster, more kinetic style of some of the later games uh, fights would suit this boss really well. Kind of like how they fight, like handle their fight with Artorias in Dark Souls 1, for example, or the nameless king and Dark Souls 3 again to give another example but I'm getting ahead of myself here but speaking of challenge the next area where you fight the three hat phantoms is much harder than the previous fight in my opinion one's always going for draining your stamina the other goes for big heavy hits and the other stays back to pelt you with arrows now remember when I said that legends brought bosses to life to get ever in this game this is when it comes to passing Boletaria as it could have been inferred at least what I think it is is that these are the phalanx the tower knight and the penetrator respectively when they were still human, and the war stories they passed on gave rise to larger than life images from, from them due to the power of the old one. The next section, uh, there's no other way to put this, this game just absolutely shits itself. It's another dragon obstacle course where you have to run past while dodging their fire breath, but this time there's two dragons breathing fire at the same time. And the game, bless its heart, it, it just can't handle it. it, it just cannot deal with it. I can practically feel the PS3 about to implode in this area whenever I play this game, and it's just really not fun when that can affect your run up to the final boss, and, and I can easily see people making the wrong judgement call on when to run thanks to fr the frame rate and dying because of it, and that's obviously super frustrating and not fun for the player at all. Which is such a shame so close to the end of such an impressive game, I feel. 
But before we get to the end, we have one more pit stop. If you followed Ostrava's questline through to the end, it's revealed that he's actually the son of the king, Alant. Horrified at the revelation, his father is now a demon, and essentially the reason why his home is in ruin. Ostrava leaves a key with you and kills himself. Now I can see what they were trying to do with Ostrava, to get you attached to him as a frequent friendly face and then have him fall at the last hurdle with nothing that you can do. And while it is sad, especially since he doesn't fully understand the fate of his father, it kind of misses the mark for me. What I'd like to see in this expanded upon in the remake, whether we get more time dedicated to Ostrava or expanding on more and what and how exactly he found out about his father's fate, having his phantom be the final enemy you fight before the boss is a nice touch though. Although there is one more optional boss we have as I mentioned before, All King Doran. This absolute unit of a man is pretty infamous among the Souls community I believe, and I can see why. He constantly regenerates health and stamina, he can kill even a beefy high level player under about 2 hits, and if you're lucky for an attack that's not a spell, backstab or parry to do more than double figures against him. I tried and tried and tried to fight him honestly, but I just eventually caved in when one of the few methods available to a melee build to cheese him. You see, if you backstab him before his voice line ends, he'll always repeat that voice line and he's only programmed to attack you once his dialogue is over, meaning you can backstab him on repeat without him being able to attack you. Now this worked for me for a time, but my aim was off for one of the backstabs so it was back to square one. What I had to do instead is have my feet string equipped, backstab him, run away to where the AI can't track me, run back in, backstab, rinse and repeat for what I say was the better part of 30 minutes just on end. I have no idea what they'll do for him in the remake, but I hope they keep him, and a part of me really wants him to be as stupidly overpowered as he was in the original release. Bit of a tangent, I know, but I had to include this absolute madman somewhere in this video. <laughs> We're finally here, the final boss, Old King Alant, or maybe we should call him False King Alant. This boss is a pretty good challenge. He's fast, hits like a truck, and if you get grabbed by him, he can even de-level your character. Something like this isn't seen again in the Soul series to this day as far as I'm aware, and it really makes him stand out as a boss, I feel. My only real complaint is his AoE. Again, any time that he tries this, like with his pet dragons, the game just can't handle it and shits itself, potentially leading to some damage that while can be avoided, the player might still get hit through no fault of their own. Again, unfortunate, and something like this would absolutely need to be touched up for the remake, but overall I still found the land to be a difficult but overall enjoyable fight. Although calling him the final boss was a bit sneaky on my part. I did see False King instead of Old King for a reason. Return to the Nexus and the Maiden in Black will finally take you to where the Old One sleeps, right below the Nexus. Kind of creepy that the source of everything has just been under our hub, our safe space for the entire game. That's kind of cool, but also harrowing in a strange kind of way, I feel. Once we enter this new area, we fight what's really become of King Alant, a creepy nihilistic slug man. This is more of a pity killing than a boss fight, but it works really well for the hopeless, tragic atmosphere the game has been going for this entire time. After putting a line down, we're now given a choice. If we go for the good ending and let the Maiden in Black uh, put the Old One back to sleep, or we can kill the Maiden in Black and take the Old One's power for ourselves. In my playthrough, I went for the good ending, but the theme for the bad ending, the one who craves souls, oh boy, this is probably the best song in the entire OST. That being said, is it worth it to kill your game-long companion and more than likely become a horrible slug creature for one banger of a tune? That's up to you to decide. Now, I'm going to go a little bit off the cuff for the next couple of minutes and just go through basically a recap of what I really like about the game and a little bit more into what I hope the remake uh, touches into. So um, for the next bit, I'm just going to go completely off script for a little bit and just kind of gush about this game overall before capping things off. Okay, so this is just going to be completely no script like the rest of the video, off the cuff, just... Basically capping off what I really like about Demon Souls, what I really want to see for the remake, um, and probably I might go through all the bosses that I, I didn't die to, because there was quite a few and I was very proud of myself, so I want to I wanna be smug about it, <laughs> even though it's not an accomplishment at all. Um, so the main thing for the remake, um, I'm recording this just towards like the end of October, so the remake is less than a month away. Um, what I really want to see is, um, like I mentioned in the video, the main thing's the frame rate. I want to see the frame rate touched up. Um, either just like totally consistent 60 FPS or higher. Um, that's what I want to see, basically. What I would like, um, mainly, is for them to not 
struggle with what they've gone through with a lot of the later Souls games where you'll you'll kill an enemy and so sometimes it works like you'll kill an enemy and then oh it'll be the second phase and they'll have a health bar and they'll, they'll grow taller or whatever uh, i feel like for what it's when it's done in those games it's fine but i don't want them to go back and make it like that with demon souls so say i don't know you kill the dirty colossus for example and then it comes back as the dirtier colossus and it, it gains another health bar you know i feel like the bosses were fine as they were for the most part um just sort of very clear but unique gimmicks that's all that they really needed one thing I really want them to touch up on is the is the dragons. If they're going to keep the dragons, it will be cool to make them like actual bosses with AI that react to you. Um, because they don't in the PS3 version. Like I said, they just on a totally set path or set behavior, and they'll never change no matter what you do. So you can either just snipe them up from like afar, and it'll take ages, but you'll kill them, or you can be a fucking idiot and try and fight them melee, and you'll just die. Um, so I'd, li I'd like the bosses, um, because it, it says in the, they don't have a health bar, but it says in the wiki that they're bosses, so I would like that to be touched up on, um, that would be cool. Um, one thing I want them to do, like I mentioned before, they need to keep Maiden in Australia the, literally the same, they need to keep it exactly the same, if they change that in any way, I'm gonna be so mad, <laughs> I'm gonna be so mad. Um, we've seen them, uh, go with... Uh, they, they've also, I want them to stay consistent with sort of the art style, that's what I wanted to say. Um, when we saw the initial release trailer, I remember a big point of controversy was the Flame Lurker boss's design, um, which to me it wasn't a big deal, but some people are saying it's been like a deal breaker for the remake, which I, I don't think, it was a bit disappointing to see them go with a more just generic demon kind of design, but it's nothing serious but they've changed it back to how it was before where it looked like a melting kind of face rather than just a generic demon which looks really cool so i'm glad that i just want them to keep to the art style of the original game as much as humanly possible because i don't feel like it was the art or the designs of the characters and enemies that was the problem it's mainly the performance that's the issue with demon souls um so that's really the main thing. I, w I don't really have much in terms of what I want for the remake, apart from just a consistent, stable frame rate. Um, but it would be cool if they could have that broken arch stone, which was going to be like a snow world, a snow level. I don't think it's going to happen, but if it is, it'll probably be DLC, but that would be cool. Um, so I'm going to go through all the bosses. Um, I might do a Demon Souls, or just a Soul Series tier list um, in the future. Um... So I didn't die, I'm going to go to all of them that I didn't die. So I didn't die at the Adjudicator, the, it's in alphabetical order on the wiki, just to, just to clarify, so I'm going through them that way. So I didn't die to the Adjudicator, the Armoured Spider, the Dirty Colossus, the Flame Lurker, King Alan. no wait, no I did die at King Alan. Uh, that's a light. The Man Eaters, Maiden Astraya, the Old Hero, uh, the Old Monk, the Penetrator, the Phalanx, the Storm King, and the Tower Knight, and I guess the, the later thing of the Vanguard. I died to him in the tutorial, I didn't die to him in the actual uh, actual fight. Um, but a few of the bosses I did die to, but most of them I got them in one hit. Um, so that was, that's that. I haven't said the dragons because I didn't even attempt to fight them, because like I say, you have to help help with arrows and, they, um, and then they'll, they'll die. Okay, so while I was at in this video, um, there's been quite a bit that's came out in regards to the Demon Souls remake, and I'm not sure where exactly I can put it. Um, I didn't want to make a separate video for it, because I wasn't really going to harp on it too long, but um, I figured I'd just put it at the end of here. So, we got a new gameplay trailer. Um, it was mainly going through the Stone Fang Tunnel, um, showed us the Armored Spider fight and the Flame Lurker boss, and it's like updated design, and it teased a little bit of some of the upcoming bosses and areas like it showed a little bit of the old hero um the dragons and boletaria 1-3 that sort of thing and then after that an interview with the sort of director of the project gavin moore um came out as well and um, pretty much immediately after um so i the, there's a couple of things i wanted to talk about because it seems to address a lot of sort of my criticisms with demon souls in particular um stone stone fang tunnel 
seems to be a little bit more dynamic um, in terms of it. Um, I, I don't know whether that's because it's a new and shiny remake or like they actually tweaked enemy placement a little bit here and there um, just to make things more dynamic or enemy behavior. But it felt a bit more dynamic than I remembered um, playing the PS3 version. Uh, omnidirectional rollings confirmed. Um, that's a really good sort of quality of life change. Um, unfortunately, they've confirmed that the Sixth Art Stone isn't going to be made into sort of new content, which I get why they wanted to keep to the spirit of the original and they didn't want to create a new area without sort of FromSoft and Miyazaki's input. Which, but it's a little bit disappointing, but hey, oh, it is what it is. Um, from what I know, um, it seems like the only capacity item capacity because in demon souls um something i forgot to mention in my video i think you can only have in all the souls games you have a weight capacity but in demon souls you have an item capacity as well meaning if you get an item sort of exploring the level and you have exceeded your item capacity you can't pick that item up and if you try and then go to clear space you, you potentially lost that item forever now, I don't know if it's been confirmed, but from the wording of that interview, it seems like the only thing they've done with item capacity is how much healing grass you could take. Because healing grass practically weighed nothing, and you could just spam your way through the level just eating healing grass, and you can effectively be very, very hard to kill. So it seems like the only limit they have is healing grass, which I hope so. Um, that would be a really cool change, and you could store more healing grass with Stockpile Thomas, which keeps him... Uh, an important NPC in the game. Um, that would be a very, very clever change, I feel, so I hope that's what they mean. Um, now, there's some things that uh, you said that I am very excited for, and some things that worried me a little bit, and it's particularly with um, the enemies and the bosses in particular. Um, they're staying very, very true to the original. I believe that they said that they basically recreated the AI from the original PS3 version and you can see that a little bit with the flame lurker fight um, so which I think is a good thing I don't really want them to change a lot of the bosses apart from like I say the dragon god and um, they've changed the mat the not the mania sorry the armored spider a little bit so he's shooting oil and then sort of setting it on fire rather than just a fire spell which I think is um, which is much more cooler visually and um, more interesting as a gameplay dynamic um, and he said, which is my favourite part of the interview, because they talked about the Maiden Astraea fight and the fight with Gar Vinland, and one of the people doing the interview asked if the fight was going to be changed anyway, and he said, and I'm paraphrasing, but you don't change Gar Vinland, and <laughs> that was just re I was just listening to that interview, and I was like, king, king moment, you do not change Gar Vinland, you're absolutely right. Um... But the so that's something I'm very very happy with. They're keeping the bosses mostly to their original um, state, and um, bar maybe some like art style changes. But the one thing I'm worried about is the dragons. Uh, as I said in my, in my Demon Souls video earlier, dragons are probably one of the weakest parts of the game. If we're talking about enemies specifically, they're definitely the worst parts of the game because they're not dragons. They're not animals. They they're obstacles. They're just set AI pathing. That don't do anything other than what they've been set out to do and don't react to you dynamically at all. Now I hope they do change it a little bit where melee characters have a bit more of a chance and a bit more fun fighting a dragon. But I'd get why they'd want to keep it the same also even though I think that's... If they do, if they just don't do anything with it that would be a big, big miss... Miss sight I guess on their part. Um, again, that's, that's my opinion anyway. I suppose you could say well just... Play with a ranged weapon or learn death cloud or poison mist and you, you're fine but I don't think like you should have to change your build substantially to beat one honestly not cool but not that important enemy um, but again that's just because they're optional bosses that's just my uh, my opinion so it should be obvious after my like eight however long this video is of gushing over this game um but yeah demon souls is absolutely still worth revisiting i think even with the remake looming over the horizon i still believe that the original ps3 release is, is just absolutely worth going back to to this day even with every every other souls game that's come out and like i say with the remake on the horizon i think that it 
the original version is still fantastic. There's something just so wonderfully unique and like interesting about Demon's Souls specifically. Um, I'll be covering those games soon enough. I, I don't really have any schedule or whatever in terms of when I'll do it. They'll, they'll be done when they're done. And I'll be discussing what I think about the remake in another video when that game comes out. And I might do a boss tier list of all the FromSoft games after I do my analysis on each. I'll be doing some Sonic videos, I, I probably. Um, I might do some like reviews or analysis on, on a lot of the Sonic games. Like I say, I'm, I'm not sure yet. Um, but I just hope people will look forward to future content um, and to get footage as well. I'll be streaming uh, the me playing through the Souls games or whatever games I decide you know I want to play. Absolutely no schedule in terms of streaming, it's just I do it when I feel like it for now um, until I guess I have a few more people that want to watch my stuff. <laughs> um, so I hope people will look forward to just my future content like I say. So until next time, uh, see ya.